My name is Louis Rosen. I was born in New York City, not the best part of the city. Uh, I'm now almost 85 years old. Uh, my parents were immigrants uh, from Poland. Uh, they were escaping from the pogroms which were taking place uh, with the R uh, Russian Cossacks coming in and raiding uh, villages, especially where uh, Jews were plentiful. And uh, my father came over here in about 1909, and my mother, they were uh, girl and boyfriends uh, in, in the old country, came over two years uh, later. Uh, my uh, father was trained uh, as a tailor, uh, starting at 10 years of age. He went uh, to a senior tailor for training. And of course, he did a lot of work with uh, probably very little pay at that time. But anyway, uh, so for quite a, some time we had ancestors, and that's important for a reason I'll tell you in a moment, uh, in, in so-called old country. Well, one thing that always amazed me and my brother is that none of our ancestors, as far as we can determine, ever had any formal education. <laughs> they, some of them were self-taught, and uh, my father eventually became very good, uh, not so much in English, but, but in Yiddish. And he wrote for what was then the chief uh, Jewish newspaper, the, the uh, Forward. Uh, it's now in English as, as well. Uh, but anyway, the important fact is that since we could remember, it was a given that no matter what it took, my brother and I were, to go, were going to go to college. <laughs> uh, and I think that's an enormous tribute uh, to parents like, like ours. And I'm sorry I didn't get to interview my brother because he is the famous one in the family. He was, for quite some years, executive director of the Civil Service Commission. Uh, I thought when I had four or 500 employees, why, that, that was plenty. He had 2.2 .2 million. <laughs> so um, that's a good part of my background. Now, um, when I was very young, uh, I remember going to school in, in New York City with kids from various nationalities and having to fight every day when I was five or six years old. But my father contracted tuberculosis working in the sweatshops of uh, New York City, and his doctor said, if you want to live, you've got to get out of here. So uh, they had saved up about $800, uh, which they used for a down payment on a house in the Catskill Mountains. And that's where I grew up, as, and my brother as well. Uh, well, uh, the question was, what do you do for a living there? It was a hotel uh, area so-called Borscht Belt, uh, uh, Liberty, Monticello, Lock Sheldrake. We lived in and near Lock Sheldrake, New York. I used to, I went to a one-room school where all eighth grades were taught by one teacher. Uh, there were about 40 students, and each class would in turn go to the front row for the day's teaching, and the others would be in the back they had to be quiet, but they could learn a lot from the ones who were ahead of them. Uh, we used to walk to school about three miles, uh, that, which was not unusual in, in that part of the country at, at the time. During the winter, it was rough because sometimes we'd have four or five feet of snow, uh, but I was lucky. My teacher was a farmer who lived on the other side of, of us from, from the school. And he would come by with a horse and sleigh and I would hitch a ride with him uh, to school. So uh, I, had a, I had a good. 
anyway, um, that's the way we started our schooling. Uh, later on, we uh, uh, became caretakers of one of the hotels during the winter, and so we were uh, not so isolated, and uh, uh, we both went to school uh, in a little town where you had uh, grades. and Well, up to about the eighth grade, we only had two teachers or three teachers at most for different subjects. But in high school, we had teachers for different subjects. Uh, now, so how did we manage to get enough money to go to college? <laughs> well, my father was uh, uh, very creative, and he uh, managed to get a dealership to sell newspapers to hotel guests. And we were the ones who did the selling. So we'd get up about 6 o'clock or 5 o'clock in the morning, go get our newspapers, and then during breakfast, we'd go to all hotels and sell newspapers. In the afternoon, we had an old car with a refrigerator in it, and it was dry ice. And we would sell ice cream to the kids in the hotels and rooming houses. And in the evening, again, we would go around during mealtime and sell evening papers. So uh, that was the way by the time I had to go to college and then two years later my brother, uh, I had, we had accumulated uh, $425 that could be made available. So I looked around for a college where I could go for that amount of money. The University of Alabama fit the bill. They had a good physics department, people from Caltech and, and uh, Cornell, because this was depression. It was hard to get uh, teaching jobs. So I, I and my brother, too, uh, a year later wound up University of Alabama, and that's where I took my bachelor's degree, my master's, and I taught there for one semester until I could go to Penn State. Uh, the head of the department was a person by the name of Dr. Wooten, W-O-O-T-E-N. He was a marvelous gentleman. And uh, he, he knew all the heads of physics departments, and he got me a fellowship uh, at Penn State, which paid, um, as I remember, $120 a month. Well, that's where my wife came in. She was a top-notch secretary, and she got a job as a secretary, so she worked my way through graduate school. <laughs> uh, well, the war came, and I w we were already at Penn State. So the first thing I wanted to do was enlist in the Navy. But you wouldn't believe it, I was three pounds underweight. <laughs> they wouldn't take me. <laughs> so I went back and proceeded to get my... PhD degree, towards the end of which a Dr. Tritton, who was President Roosevelt's head of scientific personnel, came to Penn State recruiting for a position he couldn't talk about and a place he couldn't mention, but he thought he knew what he wanted. And uh, he talked to the head of the department, a Dr. Ham was the head of the department, and he decided that he wanted me to take this job, which he couldn't tell me about. <laughs> uh, I knew of Dr. Tritton's reputation, and when he told me that there is nothing I could do to help with war effort which would be anywhere near as important as what he was asking me to do. So I said, okay, it's a deal. What do I do next? Well, he says, you appear uh, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, as soon as possible. We had a, a one-month-old baby and a 36 Ford. So we packed up uh, our few belongings and set out uh, for uh, Chattanooga, I think it was Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, they didn't. He told us there was not a house for for the family yet for for us, 
but of course there would be. So we packed up, we got in touch with Mary's parents, and her father met us. I, it was one of the big cities in Tennessee at a hotel, and Mary and the baby went with him to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where I had met Mary at the university. Uh, and uh, I trucked on with this 36 Ford uh, to Santa Fe. Well, coming in to Santa Fe, it looked almost like a medieval vi village. Uh, uh, very crude streets, very narrow streets, mud houses. Uh, the people were not badly dressed, but you could tell uh, they didn't buy much clothes. Uh, anyway, I was told to proceed to uh, 1663 Palace Avenue, East Palace Avenue, and, which I did. And there, and, and some office number, and there I met Dorothy McKibben, one of the loveliest ladies that you will ever want to meet. And uh, she told me how to get up to the hill. And uh, she, at that point in time, was also the manager of Frijoli's uh, uh, establishment. For whole, uh, the the, the uh, there it's not a hotel. It wasn't a hotel, but there are uh, NYA built log cabins. Uh, which mainly the Forest Service used, but now they, they got rid of the Forest Service people and it, it was devoted to scientists who were coming in who did not have a, a place at Los Alamos. So uh, if I got to Los Alamos, uh, I was chauffeured uh, down into Frijoles Canyon and there I met Dorothy McKibben again. She was supervising the evening meal. Uh, I wasn't there long, a few weeks, but it was delightful. We were driven there uh, every morning. Every morning, uh, we were we were picked up uh, by submariners who had come to Los Alamos uh, for rest periods, and at night they would drive us back. Well. The thing I remember is that they were very, had very bad nervous problems, and that's why they were sent to rest up. And so they drove very fast in order to hide the fact that they would shake all the time. Well, this did not make the ride, it was a dirt road with potholes liberally strewn. Uh, and one day we were flying along this road, bouncing in this jeep. And here came a huge turkey. Uh, we scared it, and it flew, and we couldn't avoid it. We hit it, we hit it with our windshield. It didn't break the windshield, but it didn't it do the turkey any good. It died. We took the turkey, and Dorothy McKibben cooked it for us the next day. That was a, a real treat. Isn't it amazing the things you remember? <laughs> well, anyway, uh, after only a few weeks there, they, uh, I, I was told uh, there's a house ready for us. It was a, I think it was a two-bedroom prefab house with a black beauty wood stove. And, uh, you know, for that time and in that place, uh, it was nothing to be sneezed at. Uh, anyway, they, uh, they told me I could bring Mary and the baby. Now, how do you do that? Well... She got on a plane in Birmingham, Alabama, and was bumped in Dallas by a general. And here she was in this hotel with a baby, running out of food coupons, milk coupons. And fin I don't know how she did it, but she was managed to get in touch with the, the personnel uh, director at Los Alamos. And she told him her predicament, and he told me her predicament. So, uh, I said, well, I have to go get her. But at that point in time, you could only go 50 miles from Los Alamos. So I told my supervisor 
that uh, I just have to go get my wife and whatever penalty there is, that, that'll be it. And he said, well, just go ahead. So, but I had to have gas coupons. Uh, so I went to Santa Fe where the coupon board resided and I told them my predicament and they assumed that since uh, I was going to Dallas, I must have permission from the high up authorities and they gave me the coupons. And so off I went to Dallas to pick up my wife and baby. And then as fast as I could, I came back to Los Alamos. I came back in, during the few rainy periods. And the road up the hill was treacherous. It was mud. It was slippery. There were no guardrails. A very narrow dirt road. And... Uh, Mary was scared as we were driving up. She said she's never going off the hill. <laughs> but anyway, I was worried about what she would think of the housing arrangements. So I had the idea that I would drive up to what were hutments where the uh, maids that were servicing the laboratory and the housing of the scientific people where they uh, lived. These, uh, you know what they looked like. They're just long buildings, dome-shaped buildings, and they look like the devil. And they, they were, they were not uncomfortable inside, but they looked terrible. So I said, "Well, okay, I drove up to front one of them, and Mary said, "Is this where we're going to live?" I didn't say anything, and she started to cry. <laughs> so I backed up and turned around and went to our little duplex, and boy, did it look good. <laughs> so that's where we lived for about a year and then as soon as the war ended we moved into Fermi's apartment which he had vacated uh, on Trinity Drive these, these were luxury wooden floors uh, central heating there was only one problem they, didn't, they put them together very fast and in many of the four quadruplexes uh, only uh, one of the apartments, a downstairs apartment, had had the heat control. Uh, and uh, sometimes they would reverse the controls accidentally so that if, you, if it was cold and you turn it hotter, it went colder. And if you're in the upstairs apartment, you would draw down, hey, Either we're broiling or we're freezing, and they knew that they had turned it the wrong way. <laughs> but we lived there for about a year until permanent housing became available. Mary was chair lady uh, of the Women's Advisory Housing Committee, so she had she she's a, a designer and a, an artist. And she has very good taste, and she uh, managed the design of the. Uh, housing that we still live in, although we have changed it. Uh, we now have an indoor swimming pool, among other things. So it was not something that you even thought about with uh, those days. Well, anyway, so so here we are in Los Alamos. I am now assigned to Ed McMillan's group. He is now a Nobel laureate. His group was responsible, as you probably heard when I talked, for te for development. Uh, of implosion technology. And uh, that consisted in, in an unclassified language of finding out how to use chemical explosives in a way that you could assemble fissional material to a dense enough state and held together for a long enough time so that a critical mass had been achieved and, and remained critical at, for a long enough time to give a appropriate energy release. But that was a very difficult problem. Uh, now the gun device, that was a given, and we didn't have to worry about that. That was, but that was just for, well, the big surprise that we had at Los Alamos had to do with the discovery by uh, Segre, Emilio Segre, uh, who was one of Fermi's students, actually, in Rome, 
the discovery that plutonium had a very high spontaneous fission rate. This meant that the assembly of plutonium would have to be done so quickly that there would not be time for a stray neutron for a spontaneous fission to release stray neutrons which would pre-detonate the assembly. That was the big surprise and the major difficulty that had to be solved at Los Alamos. Uh, well, uh, it involved learning how to uh, manufacture and fabricate and utilize chemical explosives. Uh, and that's what I did for about a year uh, or so. Uh, I, if you read the Monitor, you would, you'll see a story where he tells about uh, my extracurricular activity. Each one of the staff members was, was entitled to have a project that took 20% of the time that was not immediately related uh, to uh, uh, the goal of that group, just to keep, keep their spirits up and keep their wits sharp in terms of discovery of new, of new uh, ideas, new processes. Well, I chose a project to measure the attenuation of electromagnetic sig signals by high explosives when they detonate. When they detonate, they create ions. Ions are then conductors of electricity. An electromagnetic signal surrounded by a conductor uh, gets through feebly if the conductor is really a good conductor. The question was, uh, how good a conductor is exploding high, is, is detonating high explosives when it's in a gaseous phase. And that's what I worked on it. Nobody really cared very much about it. Uh, but it did have some relevance to what we were doing because uh, we had to measure the collapse time uh, of a, of a configuration of materials. And in order to do that, you put it in a magnetic field, and uh, when, a ma when magnetic material uh, collapses in a magnetic field, eddy currents are produced, and these can be picked up. These eddy currents tell you how fast the collapse is taking place. And that was the critical piece of information in, in, in addition to the symmetry of the collapse that one needed to have in order to determine what the yield would be of a certain amount of subcritical material to start with. So uh, it was not entirely uh, out of what our interests were, but it was interesting that, as near as I could tell, nobody cared about these results. But I published them every month, uh, in fact, a few months before the test at Trinity, we had to write uh, progress reports. Uh, I think it was once a week. Uh, so these reports were available, but as near as I could tell, nobody read them, except the ones they were interested in, and that wasn't one, of, one, of, one that I was doing. <laughs> but the final test before Trinity was in Pyrito Canyon at Kreutz's group, had uh, been given the uh, assignment to make a one-third scale model of the device that was going to be finally tested and to make a final test of the collapse time so that we would be sure that a reasonable yield uh, would result. Well, he did, the t he did the experiment. As everybody was already at, Trin uh, at the Trinity site, and the collapse time was very long. And if that was really the collapse time, we would have a pre-detonation. The, the, uh, 
the bomb would be a failure. Well, fortunately, uh, the head of the theoretical division was Hans Bethe. He was out there with Oppenheimer, and Oppenheimer said, Hans, go, go and figure out what is going on here. Uh, and Beta, whom nobody could, build, could beat cal in calculating it uh, from first principles, he devised a theory, but he had to anchor it. And he remembered seeing these data, <laughs> which I had been feeding them every month about the attenuation of electromagnetic signals by detonating high explosive. And he anchored his theory uh, with these data and was able to tell Oppie, look, uh, the, uh, ex the chemical explosion is distorting uh, the results that they're getting. And the distortion is, su is such and such, and if you take out that distortion, everything is okay. So that was my first mini triumph at Los Alamos. <laughs> but then, when the war ended, uh, uh, implosion studies for a while ended, and I was glad of that, and I moved over to do basic research in nuclear science. I had never had a course in nuclear science, but Beta had written three articles for reviews of modern physics on nuclear physics. And I had read those articles and became convinced that, gee, you know, this has got to be the field of the future. And I, I think many of us realized at that time that the world was going to run out of energy, it was going to run out of food, it was going to run out of water, but the basic requirement is energy, because if you have energy, you can make fertilizer, you can grow food, you can desalinate the oceans, you can have fresh water, and you can have factories which <laughs> run on energy. Uh, solar energy was at that time, and mostly it still is, not a viable option. I won't, won't go into the reasons for that. Cost being one, but it's more than cost. Uh, so I decided that this had to be a very important field, and I studied my way into becoming a nuclear physicist. <laughs> uh, at that time, Penn State did not have a course in nuclear physics. Most universities didn't. That's how, uh, how young the science was. So uh, I started uh, working with the cyclotron, which had been liberated from Harvard, for the war effort. It was not a very good machine, but one of the first, one of the very first. And I started to study the interactions of the high, uh, uh, hydrogen and helium isotopes, because that's fundamental. You need to know the basic interactions of nucleons before you can understand nuclei. They are made up of nucleons. Uh, that was a no-brainer. Uh, and I thought I was, it was basic research which probably wouldn't have any application to anything. But was I ever wrong about that? <laughs> uh, because uh, very soon after that, President Truman uh, decided, well, first I should have told you that uh, right after the war, it was devastating for Los Alamos Laboratory. Almost all the senior scientists went back to their universities, which was very good for the nation. They had to train the next generation of scientists, but it was a disaster for the laboratory. However, some of us, mainly the younger people, stayed. And one of the reasons a number of us stayed was that we knew from our parents who knew from their relatives who were still in Europe uh, what a horrible uh, dictator Stalin was. And we realized that this world was not going to be a safe place as long as Stalin was able to muster the kind of military might that 
the old Soviet U Union could, could assemble, and that we better not uh, leave uh, nuclear weaponry in its infancy. Well, we made the right decision, because very soon uh, it was discovered that the Soviets were working on a hydrogen bomb. First, of course, they had Fuchs. And the greatest thing that Truman did to start with was to not make a big deal about the fact that Fuchs was a spy and he defected uh, and he gave the Soviets information which helped them uh, probably by several years to develop the first atomic bomb. Had he done what was done when Wen Ho Lee uh, uh, was first apprehended, we would have been really in a sad situation. But he was a very wise, you know, he was a hat salesman, but he was very wise. And he decided he was, we're just going to forget about that. That's, that's history. And we're going to stay ahead. Well, Truman realized, although he didn't have a, an understanding of really how atomic bombs worked, he realized that if nature was such as to make a, a nuclear energy feasible, eventually everybody would know how to do it. So our job was to stay ahead and to make sure that nobody uh, outdid us in understanding what can be done, how it can be done, and how to take uh, pr protective action against uh, this new threat, which is absolutely bound to develop. Okay, so uh, that was the first thing he did that made Los Alamos able to survive. But the second thing he did was he found out through intelligence that the Russians were going to develop a hydrogen bomb. And of course, nobody knew whether it could be done, but he asked us, he, he dictated a, a, a crash program at Los Alamos to see if a fusion bomb can be developed, and if so, to develop one. Well, given the crash program to develop an H-bomb, it became possible to hire people. We did not lack for resources for the next 10 or 15 years. Everything that uh, Norris Bradbury, in testifying before Congress, was asked by a congressman, uh, Dr. Bradbury, what are you doing to save money? And his reply was, the purpose of the Los Alamos Laboratory is not to save money. It is to spend money, but to do so wisely. I thought that was an accurate and beautiful response. He was never again asked that question. <laughs> well, so here we are now uh, working very hard. During the war, we worked six or seven days a week. I still remember a story uh, about Segray not showing up some Sundays. And at one point, Fer he was in Fermi's group. Fermi called him in. He, he was a former student of Fermi. And, and Segray, uh, uh, Fermi asked him, Emilio, why is it I didn't see you here uh, yesterday, Sunday? And Emilio told him, well, I went fishing. Fishing? How can you go fishing when we have so many problems here that need to be solved? And Segre explained to him how complex fishing is, how you have to uh, 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 wrap flies exactly right, how you have to stand so the fish do not see you, how you cannot talk or make any noise, how you have to decipher exactly in which hole the big fish might be. Finally, Fermi said to him, oh, I see, it's a battle of wits. <laughs> uh, well, that's aside from the story. Okay, so we're developing the H-bomb. And then my earlier research really started paying off in two very significant ways. In the first place, 
as I said, that cyclotron was very old, and in order to use it, uh, we designed and the shops built a camera which had nucle nuclear emulsion detectors all the way around so that in a 30-minute run, run, you could take energy and angular distributions at all angles and energies simultaneously. And this was a godsend. We could do experiments with a very recalcitrant cyclotron. But we had to develop the techniques for recording the data on nuclear emulsions and then reading it. This took microscopes. We had to train people to be microscopists. We did all this in jig time. And pretty soon we had the largest nuclear microscopy group in the world. And we became experts not only on detecting charged particles, but on using nuclear emulsions to measure neutron energies by way of having the neutron that comes in collimated and hitting a hydrogen nucleus in the emulsion, projecting it, and we measure that and the angle, we know the energy. So that so-called emulsion technique for neutron spectroscopy be became a crucial part of uh, garnering the data necessary to design thermonuclear devices and, uh, and also uh, for detecting the first neutrons from a thermonuclear explosion at Anuitak. That same technique. That's why it was so important. Well, uh, we worked very hard uh, uh, on measuring neutron spectra from many elements of interest to the fusion program. And then in 1951, I think it was, came the critical test of whether, uh, whether the idea that had been developed by Teller and Ulam for igniting thermonuclear fuel with a fission device as the energy source, whether that would really work. And I think you heard me tell the story of that uh, at, at the uh, ceremony Monday. Uh, we, you see, what I couldn't uh, have time to talk about was how, how risky a, a, an experiment was. However, it was the only experiment that worked to determine unambiguously whether the, the fusion fuel had burned and with what efficiency. Nuclear emulsions are um, 200 to 400 microns thick on one by three inch glass plates. And the unbelievable thing for many people was how we were going to put those emulsions, which blacken with only uh, a few hundred milli Rentkens of radiation, when this bomb would cause radiation of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Rentkens, uh, how they could survive and how would 16-inch glass plates survive from the blast of a very la rather large, at that time, a fission device? Well, uh, so, you know, most people thought this was a crazy experiment, uh, but we built enormous steel and concrete collimators to, to shield the plates and to collimate the beam of neutrons. And it worked. Uh, and uh, I think one of the greatest thrills that I've ever had uh, in science was uh, two days, we couldn't immediately re uh, get the plates because the radiation levels were too, was too high. We had to wait till the short live radionuclides uh, uh, died down. And we went in uh, two days after the, the, the blast. My colleague, John Allred, who is no longer with us, he was my first graduate student to do a thesis at Los Alamos. Uh, he was driving the 6x6. Six six, uh, and we had a, 
a monitor, a radiological monitor with us, and the monitor asked him, John, John was a very tall, six foot three, 220 pound Texan. And he said, John, what do we do if this car breaks down in that radiation field? He had a, a meter, and he was going to tell us when we had had as much radiation as was allowable. We'll have to turn around and go back. And John told him, the car breaks, if the, car break, the truck breaks down, you won't see me. I will disappear so fast. <laughs> that did not encourage our, our monitor. Anyway, we retrieved the plates, took them to our temporary laboratory, and uh, uh, processed them. And the next morning, it was when Teller came in and wanted to know if we had observed unambiguously. He didn't know it was almost two days, and he still didn't know, because all the other experiments that were supposed to look at the 14 MV neutrons, they failed. They were all electronic experiments. They were swamped by the gamma rays and fission neutrons. Edward Teller came in. This is my recollection. His recollection is somewhat different, I, m I must tell you, but I can't help it. This is the way I came in. Can you, have you seen 14 MeV neutrons? Because that's the signature of fusion fuel burning, the DT reaction. Have you seen that unambiguously? We took a plate out of the water, which you really should never do, because it has swelled up, put it under uh, 500 time magnification, and there were these beautiful proton recall tracks all lined up parallel to each other, which, and 14, they were one millimeter long, which is 14 MeV in energy. And that was the kind of thrill you get once in a lifetime. It was fantastic. Well, anyway, so that was our contribution. Uh, first, we provided data that uh, could not have been gotten uh, in that time frame any other way. And then we uh, uh, validated that the fusion uh, the process took place, and we could tell them the efficiency, uh, and everything was fine. So coming back to Los Alamos, uh, we had uh, our nuclear emulsion group uh, did many other things. We discovered the uh, uh, proton belt, high energy, several hundred MeV protons going in arcs from north to the south pole, uh, some several hundred miles up. And we did that uh, while they were testing ICBM uh, rockets. And we persuaded the Air Force to let us substitute some of the dummy warhead with nuclear emulsion. Uh, that is a long story, but it worked. And we were the first to see these protons. That has some practical importance because you don't want uh, people exposed uh, to that uh, energy proton. You have to shield our astronauts going through those layers. Well, but perhaps the most, there were two more extremely significant things. <clears throat> in, the, in the weapons area, we, pr we provided uh, data on, uh, for a number of tests so that one can analyze what happened during the explosion of a thermonuclear weapon. We did that. And we did it also for pure fission devices. But our biggest uh, contribution was when we discovered why one of the test explosions was much bigger than anybody had anticipated. And the reason had to do with the fact that uh, lithium-7, which is most of normal lithium, produces tritium when it's bombarded with 14 MeV neutrons. And that one 14 MeV neutron can produce as many as three tritium nuclei. Well, that, that only re, refuels the tritium in the device, uh, and we didn't know about that. But it also means that a thermonuclear reactor, if it can be built, 
and if you use a normal lithium shield around it, can produce more tritium than it consumes. So that, that was one of our great uh, contributions. And then, uh, well, we, did, we were the first to generate um, polarized protons, protons which have their spins all in the same direction, because you can use that to probe certain aspects of, of nuclei. Uh, and then my next really big project, which I was engaged in from 1960 uh, to the time I retired in 85, uh, to, to in, in 19, yeah, I stepped down in 85, but I retired in 1991. That was the development of the Meson factory. And this had numerous uh, goals. The main one was to have a magnet that would be a world-class means of attracting scientists from around the world, not only to bring scientific knowledge and expertise to the laboratory, uh, but to cultivate uh, world harmony. Uh, by having scientists, especially from China and, and USSR. And in fact, even during the building and the utilization of that accelerator, uh, I spent a lot of time and effort uh, trying to facilitate uh, confidence building through uh, technological cooperation. I was one of the original members of the US, USSR Joint Coordinating Committee for uh, the Fundamental Properties of Matter. We would spend one year, go one year in Soviet Union, one year in US, and lay out collaborative programs. And I think my visit, biggest success was when the Chinese government invited Mary and me to come and visit. The deal was that if we would give three lectures, one on energy, they would take us anywhere we wanted to go. Well, Mary decided where we would go, and I provided the lectures. <laughs> but the important thing was that after we had toured all these facilities and went wherever Mary wanted to go, we were met by a emissary of Fang Yi, who was the deputy prime minister at the time. He wanted to see us in his offices uh, in the emperor's palace in the secret city. And we went to see him. And uh, he welcomed us, and we talked for more than an hour. But then, at the end, I told him about his, his facilities, what was wrong, what was right, and he told me how great communism has been for China. No more, no more hunger, um, no more people without a place to live, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, at the end, he said to me, now, Professor Rosen, you know, I am in charge of all science, education, and technology in China. I don't even have a high school degree. Now, if you had my job and you wanted to bring China abreast of the Western world in science and technology, what would you do? I thought for a minute, I, I knew this was something akin to a trap, but I had to answer. So what I would do, Mr. Prime Minister, is each year identify some hundreds of the brightest young scientists and engineers and send them to centers of excellence in Europe in Japan, in North America, not for a day or a week or a month, but for at least a year, so that they can become immersed in frontier science and technology, and most importantly, understand the environment, the social and political environment, which is necessary for science and technology to, to prosper. And I thought he'd be offended by this, uh, but I didn't care. And he said to me, 
Very good idea, Professor Rosen. Now, will you accept some of these people at your laboratory? <laughs> and that was the whole reason we were invited. It was the reason for everything that happened. Well, I said to him, which he knew, well, at the present time, scientists from People's Republic can only visit Los Alamos for 14 days or whatever it was at that time. But if you will nominate scientists whom we know by their reputation, I'll see if I can get that changed. Well, I thought I'd never hear from that cat again. But three months later, I got a letter. And he said he nominated three or four scientists, very prominent ones, division leaders and group leaders from the Institute of Nuclear Research in, Be in Beijing, which was the foremost such laboratory in China. Well, then I spent a year uh, trying to make uh, the, it wasn't a DOE, it was ERD at that time, understand uh, what is involved here. And I pointed out to him, look, if we can make friends with these 1.2 billion people, it would be worth more than all the aircraft carriers and bombers that you could possibly build. And, you know, there are some risks, but uh, isn't it worth it? Fortunately, the head of uh, the defense program at that time was Herman Roser, who had been our neighbor at Los Alamos. He had been uh, in charge of the ERDA management at Los Alamos that interacted with the Lanf Lassell management. And he said, look, you know, I agree with you, but my middle management is going to be very hard to convince because they are risk averse. Well, they're all bureaucrats are risk averse, essentially. But Roser was not. And that's the one secret of a successful manager. You have to not be worried about your job. And uh, I think uh, the man you heard, Pete Nanos, I think he's in that uh, cater. Well, anyway, it took two years. But the, the ERDA finally agreed that uh, Chinese could come for up to three years, I think they said. And these wonderful people came. Uh, their work ethics were impeccable. They were no problem in any sense. So that I would list as one of my most significant accomplishments. Well, after I stepped down as director of LAMP, I'd held other position before then, group leader, division leader, lab director. After I stepped down from that, I persuaded Sig Hecker, who was then the director, that we ought to have at Los Alamos a Center for National Security Studies. Look, we're building these bombs. We have to do that. Uh, nuclear energy is essential for the life of this planet. Uh, and so we have to do what we can about that. <clears throat> but shouldn't we also be concerned about a world where weapons, nuclear weapons, are, would, would, would not be used? And he agreed. And he set up the center, and I worked there for five years. <clears throat> well, that's uh, a brief resume. <laughs> wow, a fascinating one. Well, that's great. Any questions? Well, you know, I know we're, we're just uh, skimming the surface of all that you've done and thought about all these years. Uh, and I really love the, the whole progression, and I think, you know, we'll be able to use a lot of this in you know, various contexts to help. Of course, one thing I should have emphasized and didn't is that so many people think that if we hadn't developed the atomic bomb, it would not have been developed. Nothing can be further from the truth. Ask yourself, what would be the situation if a Stalin or a, a Saddam Hussein or a Gaddafi were the first to develop this instrument? Just imagine. It's horrible to imagine. <coughs> um, well, I know you have your, your next interview, and we've got a... Um, a lot of, I don't know, whatever. <clears throat> there could be uh, 
that you haven't touched upon that we what um, just going to ask you a, a, a softball question, a big question. What lessons can we learn from the Manhattan Project for today? I think one of the main lessons we can learn is that one should not relegate fundamental research to second-class status, even when applied research is desperately in need. And the best example I have is how the fundamental research <coughs> that I did was so critical to doing so some of the applied research that had to be done. The other example I would give is that when I first went to the Soviet Union after the war, <coughs> we were shown a beautiful cyclotron, 60-inch cyclotron. At that time, 60-inch cyclotrons were the biggest built anywhere. And I asked, well, look, when did you design this? And they said that it was designed in underground bunkers during the siege of Leningrad. Now, that cyclotron helped mightily for Russian science to, to revive itself. So those are the examples I would give you. And I think, for me, that's the most important lesson we can learn from the Manhattan Project, that if you want to do big things and you can get support to do them, don't just focus narrowly on what you want to do. Have a very broad spectrum of knowledge at your disposal because you, you just don't know which piece of knowledge will be critical to achieving your objectives. That was excellent.